Thank you very much. Can, can everyone hear me? Okay. Well, uh, before I get started, I just want to take a moment or two just to, to thank George and the folks here at BYU for overlooking my allegiance to that other university up the road here and inviting me to participate in this conference. Uh, to be honest with you, it is always just an immense pleasure to come back to a state that both my wife and I consider to be our home. Uh, my wife grew up in the shadows of New York City. I grew up in Miami. But when we came out here to Utah in 1992, we really found a place that uh, we fell in love with and that we consider to be our home. And we miss it terribly. Uh, I was telling Bethany on the drive down here from Salt Lake City last night uh, that uh, you know I, just, I, I couldn't wait to get up this morning to see the mountains. Uh, and if any of you have ever been through the South Plains of Texas, uh, I think you understand why. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, before, I, before I begin my presentation, I just want to take a moment or two to just very briefly discuss how I came up with the idea uh, for writing this particular book and this particular project. And uh, when my wife and I got here in uh, 1992, I knew that I wanted to do work on Hispanics, Latinos in the American West. But I really wasn't quite sure of what the topic, specific topic was going to be. So, you know, you're always looking around, you're always uh, talking to professors, you're always discussing things with colleagues about, you know, what, what type of topics you might want to do for your dissertation. And at the same time that all this was happening, my wife and I were feeling a little bit uh, sort of like fishes out of water. Uh, you know, in Miami and, in, in, and certainly in the New York City area, you always, uh, there are Latinos everywhere and you, you can pick up Cuban food and you can pick up all sorts of, uh, of uh, goodies all, all over the place and we were feeling a little homesick and we were getting uh, what we called Cuban care packages from our families back home in Miami on a fairly regular basis. And after about four or five months in Salt Lake City, someone told me, well, what you need to do is you need to go to the Talamahu market, which is over on the west side. And to be honest with you, I really had no idea that it was there. And we went over to the Talamahu market and we were just absolutely amazed that here was a market on the west side of Salt Lake City and they had all these Latino goodies and they had guava paste and they had all sorts of these great things that we that we had back home in South Florida. So I said to myself, you know, if these folks are making a go of this business here, then obviously there has to be a community, there has to be a base of people from which to whom they can sell their products. So that is the genesis of this particular project. And uh, the result is this, uh, this little book, Hispanics and the Mormon Zion. And I think it's a wonderful story because part of what's been happening in Mexican-American history over the past, say, 15 or 20 years is that we have sort of broadened our horizons. We've begun to look at uh, Mexican-American or Mexican communities in places outside of Texas and California. Uh, so, you know, for example, if you look at the literature right now, there are books on Mexican Americans in Minnesota. Uh, there are books on Mexican Americans in Oklahoma. There are books on Mexican Americans in other parts of the Midwest. So I think it's, 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 this book fits in very, very nicely with that. And believe me, when I first started doing this research, a lot of folks came up to me and said, well, you know, uh, there's really not much there there. Well, I'm glad that I had a chance to prove them wrong. So uh, with that it, a brief introduction, let me get to, uh, to my work here, a uh, remote corner of Aslan. And, and the, the reason why I chose that title is because uh, during the 1960s, there were certain individuals within the Chicano movement, uh, some of the more militant folks in that movement, who argued that uh, the American Southwest, the lands that were taken from Mexico after the Mexican-American War, uh, were the uh, mythical homeland of the, uh, of the Aztecs and that this was part of their, the bronze continent and by golly they were going to take it back someday. So I thought that it made perfect sense because for so very long people had associated certain places in the Southwest and in the West with Mexican Americans but certainly Utah was not one of those places. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the development of the community. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the early organizations 
what was it like to live in Salt Lake City and in, and in Utah during the, uh, the Great Depression and the Second World War. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the raised expectations of the Mexican Americans who participated both in the military and who also did uh, work in factories and some of the other facilities here in the state during those years. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about the civil rights movement here in Utah, which is very, very different from the experiences in, for example, places in Texas. And then we're going to just sort of sum it up and, and look at uh, what life was like during the 1980s and up to about the year 2000 now. Uh, one thing that I do realize is that this state is growing so rapidly and that the Hispanic Latino community in this state is growing so rapidly that a lot of the statistics that you are going to see in this book, uh, population statistics and things like that, are already out of date just two, three years after the book's been published. And I'm actually very glad to hear that because that shows that, the, that there is a vibrancy here that uh, is going to make the, the Latino population an even larger and more significant contribution and part of the of the state of Utah. Um, there we go. All right, the um, the birth of the community, the 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 starting point. There's a couple of uh, of tracks that you can follow here. In South Utah, uh, around the Monticello area, uh, you are going to have Hooray. Uh, you are going to have the development of a, a community in that area. Uh, mostly the folks that are down there are going to be farmers and sheep herders. Now, where do these folks, uh, where do these folks come from? Well, just very, very briefly, and, and if it's all right, what I, what I intend to do is just simply read very short passages from the book. Uh, let me just tell you about how these folks wind up there. Uh, LDS activity in Utah virtually eliminated Spanish-Mexican trade in southern Utah, but contacts between the two groups did not disappear completely. During the last quarter of the 19th century, Spanish surnamed individuals played an important role in the livestock operations of private individuals and LDS church flocks in southern Utah. And eventually, a small community of northern New Mexicans developed in and around the town of Monticello. And by 1920, their, population, their, quote, population was substantial enough to have created several distinct neighborhoods. These newcomers occupied themselves by working their homesteads while also hiring themselves out as cowboys and sheep herders on surrounding ranches. Because of this early presence, uh, the town became a gateway for the entrance of hundreds more Hispanos to Utah. As people crossed over the border into the state, they found warm greetings in their native tongue. So that's the development of that particular community in southern Utah. But, and I mean, it, it's, it's a, an important presence. It's something that we have to recognize. But obviously, the more significant and the larger uh, pockets of concentration are going to be further north, primarily in and around the Salt Lake City area. So you, because of the development of mining, transportation, and commercial agriculture during these years, you are going to have uh, thousands not enormous numbers, but by the time that we get to about 1930, there are around 4,000, 4,500 people of, uh, of Mexican descent in the, uh, in the Salt Lake City area. So you, you, have, you have a substantial number of these folks. Uh, let me just tell you a quick story of a gentleman by the name of Rafael Torres and how he wound up in, um, in Salt Lake City. One of these trailblazers was a man named Rafael Torres from Rancho Guerrero, Michoacán, Mexico. He was born in 1901, the son of farmers. Uh, the family goes through a great deal of, tr uh, of problems and difficulties during the, uh, the Mexican Revolution. And by 1916, his mother had passed away. And uh, Rafael and his uh, brothers and sisters and his father had moved to Morelia to be with uh, his father's kin. Uh, both Rafael and his father worked in the nearby mines. And it was during this time that Rafael heard about opportunities in the United States. And like thousands, hundreds of thousands of other Mexicanos, um, he, along with, seven, with, his, with his uncle and seven other men, headed north to El Paso. And in 1919, they were hired by the Utah-Idaho Sugar Company. The men labored in the sugar beet fields of southern Idaho, where the pay was meager and the work very hard. Uh, eventually, he left that employment and he got a job with a railroad company working, in, uh, working for a railroad gang in the uh, Kemmerer, Wyoming area. 
Uh, the jobs lasted only a brief time, but as part of their severance from the railroad, they were offered passage to their next destination. And on the suggestion of one of the individuals in the group, they said, let's go to Salt Lake City. And that's how Raphael gets to, uh, gets to Salt Lake City. Now, by the time that you get to, say, the mid-1920s to about 1930, you see the development of a good, of a, of, of a definable of a, a, a community in the Salt Lake area. There are some economic differences within this community, but the overwhelming majority of these folks are doing one of three things. They're working in agriculture, they're working for the railroads, or they're working in mining. One of those three things. Actually, a lot of the folks that I came across in my research, what they would do is they would, they would work in agriculture for part of the year, they would work for the railroads for another part of the year, they would go up to uh, uh, southern Idaho for uh, other points along uh, during, during the year. But there were a couple of other individuals, there were some individuals that I was able to find that did, um, that did do other things. Uh, and one, gen one gentleman by the name of uh, Alfred Cor Cordova uh, was actually a recruiter. And he worked for the uh, Utah-Idaho Sugar Company and other companies bringing Spanish-speaking people to this area. Um, while conditions proved difficult for most Spanish speakers in Utah, agriculture during the 1910s and 20s, uh, not all associated with the industry worked in unskilled positions. The majority were laborers, but some managed to create a fairly prosperous life for themselves and their families. A few even worked as labor recruiters. Uh, one individual, Alfred Cordova, was, uh, was one of these individuals. Uh, Alfred uh, worked with a Mexican by the name of Jeff Pino who ran a labor recruitment office on, at, located at 462 West 200 South and his, he had contacts with numerous, uh, numerous uh, companies. And eventually uh, Pino dies and Mr. Cordova becomes uh, the owner of that individual business and he not only continues to, uh, to uh, operate the recruitment uh, office, but he also eventually establishes a small Mexican restaurant in the west side of Salt Lake City. And again, as far as I, I can tell, as far as I've been able to find, that was the first Mexican restaurant in the city. Okay. Now, to be honest with you, so far, the story of Mexican and Mexican Americans in Utah sounds very, very similar to the story of Mexicans and Mexican Americans in other parts of the uh, other parts of the United States, uh, they work in those three industries. Uh, I, I think the, the the way that I put this uh, when I uh, uh, in, in the book is that basically where, wherever you had people that needed, uh, where, wherever people were needed to do hard, dirty work for really low pay, you would find Mexicans or Mexican Americans. So, in other words, up to this point, the story of the uh, the folks here in Utah is really not that different from folks in the West and the Midwest. However, as you'll see in just a second, the story is going to take a different, uh, a different twist. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention bef before I go on to uh, talking a little bit about the organizations, uh, during the 19-teens and 1920s, it's a very, 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 very much a male-dominated society that uh, these Mexicanos live in. Uh, one individual that I, I Historians just live for these quotes. One individual uh, in, in an oral history interview that was done in the 1970s said, any time that you saw a Mexican woman in Salt Lake City, it was like seeing your mother. Uh, it was that big of a deal to these individuals because there were so few. But by the time that we get to the, the 1920s, some of these individuals have made the decision to stay. Some of these individuals have made the decision to, uh, uh, to, to, to continue to work for uh, some of the mining companies and so on and so forth, and, they, and you're beginning to see the arrival of a few families. And you have, by 1930, out of that 4,000 individual, those 4,500 individuals that I talked about, about 1,000 were children. So you, you are beginning to see the creation of some semblance of, uh, of family life. Uh, just to give you an example of some of the issues that uh, these folks faced when they, uh, when they got here. I uh, just want to talk a little bit about the experiences of a couple of individuals in Salt Lake City schools. 
Um, Ramon Garcia, who was a student, proved to be less patient than another person I mentioned. Although he was born in Salt Lake City in June of 26, he was targeted for abuse because of his appearance and his ethnic background. In frustration, he eventually slapped one of his teachers. Ramon was promptly arrested and taken to juvenile court. In the sixth grade, he decided to drop out of school. This Hispanic child eventually became a common laborer, earning minimal pay at a local factory. Unfortunately, this scenario would be repeated time and time again during the years covered in this, story, in this study. All right, let's talk a little bit now about what it was like, uh, excuse me, uh, a little bit about uh, the development of some social and religious groups during uh, this era. Um, let me just define for you very briefly what an ethnic network is. And I mean, it's not something that, it, it is not a, an incredibly difficult concept, I think, uh, to, uh, to comprehend. Uh, when you get to a place, you know, like when we Cuban Americans started arriving in Miami in the early 1960s, we began to look for other people like us. And eventually, uh, you began to know folks, and they would tell you, well, this person's hiring, or this person's doing this, or this person has a room for rent, and so on, and so on, and so on. And this thing just keeps multiplying. And that's kind of the issues that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, you have, uh, within the first 20 to 30 years of Mexican Americans getting, uh, of Mexicanos getting to, you, to Salt Lake City, you have the development of these, these ethnic networks. And this is going to produce uh, religious groups. It is going to produce mutual aid organizations and things like that designed to make things a little bit better for, for these folks. Now, initially, very early on, the first voice for Mexicans in Utah was the Mexican Consulate, which uh, opens in Salt Lake City in 1912. However, because of all the problems uh, back in Mexico during the years of the revolution, the consulate is really not very, very effective. And to give you a sense of how ineffective sometimes the consulate was, uh, the best example I can give you is that there is a period of time, like 1916, 1917, where the acting Mexican consulate in Salt Lake City is a Japanese individual who is actually a labor recruiter. So, I mean, that, I, I think there's a, there's a bit of a problem there. Uh, where, you know, the, the, the consulate is supposed to help these folks out, supposed to take care of them, but the guy who's doing the job is actually a consulate who makes money off of recruiting these folks. Um, by 1920, you do have uh, the first indications of some Mexican celebrations in Salt Lake City. There are celebrations of you say this at the and Cinco de Mayo in Salt Lake City, but it, it's not really anything permanent. And mostly what you have there are a few folks from the community doing a little bit of work along with uh, folks that teach Spanish or that teach Latin American history uh, from the University of Utah. However, by the early 1920s, you will begin to see the creation of mutuales, or mutual aid organizations. And this is always the case anywhere and everywhere that you find Mexican-Americans. Mutual aid societies are a very, very important part of the community. And again, just to give you a sense of what these groups do, uh, there's a group called Unión y Patria that is started during the, uh, the early 1920s. And one of the principal uh, members of this organization is a gentleman, was a gentleman by the name of Jesus Avila. Uh, a principal reason for his involvement in the organization was to fight for better treatment of Mexicans, Mexicanos and Mexican Americans by local police in Salt Lake. Jesus was disgusted with the manner in which he and his compatriots were stereotyped by local authorities. He claimed, quote, some of us were dirty, but not all of us were, and that was the problem. I had with the law because they treated us all the same way. I had no problem with them taking care of those who did wrong, but not all of us, and that is why I began to organize. In addition to standing up for better treatment of Mexicanos and Mexican Americans, groups like Unión y Patria also had uh, an insurance component. Uh, the members would throw in a certain amount of money into a pot, and then if a, an individual passed away or if an individual became sick or, or or hurt and couldn't work, the members would try to support that person's family with very minor contributions of money. So those are examples of some of the things that the Mutuales did. Now the mutual aid societies also did a lot to try to preserve Mexicano culture. So for example, Jesus Avila talks a lot about some of the, uh, the fiestas 
that his organization uh, put together and that they, they also tried to uh, teach the children of, of the community about Mexican history and they tried to make sure that these kids did not lose their Spanish. Um, here is where the story of Utah takes a different turn uh, from other places. And that is where you have Mexicanos and their association with the LDS Church. And there's just an absolutely wonderful story uh, of three Mexican women, the three Rivera sisters, uh, who are going to help to bring about the birth, the development of the Rama Mexicana, the first Mexican branch in, in the Salt Lake City area. Uh, these women were just absolutely tireless in their dedication to the church and their dedication to spreading their faith. And out of that group is going to eventually come the Lucero Ward uh, in Salt Lake City. And I, is that still uh, in, in operation, uh, Ignacio? Okay. So, I mean, this is the genesis of that particular organization. And I think really one of the interesting things that I found um, with my research into the, the history of the Lucero Ward is the fact that uh, the experience of a lot of Mexicanos who become members of the Rama Mexicana uh, is going to be is going to differ in a lot of ways from that of the uh, of the Catholic uh, folks in in uh, in the west side of Salt Lake City. So I, I talk about the benefits, but there are also limits to those benefits. Just because these individuals join the the church does not mean that uh, all vestiges of uh, racism are eliminated. Uh, let me just uh, read a quick little story here for you on. Um, an individual who uh, benefited very, very greatly from his uh, association from, with the church uh, regarding uh, an, an incident with the Salt Lake City Police. Uh, Eufemio Salazar, who uh, was from Conejos County in Colorado, uh, arrived in 1926, and uh, one day he's just walking down the street uh, on his way to work, and the police uh, pull him over. Uh, because apparently he fit the general description of someone that they were looking for. Uh, Eufemio eventually uh, tells these individuals, uh, I quote, I gave them my genealogy and all of their proper information. And one of the things that Mr. Salazar talked about is how almost immediately the way that the police treated him changed. They became very, very positive. He said, uh, uh, this, this, one of the police officers said, quote, this is a fine man. This man has done nothing wrong. Release him and take him to work. So there are some benefits. Now, I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to imply that there is no racism, that, that Mexican-Americans were not stereotyped. But there are differences in the experiences between the individuals who are affiliated with the Rama and those who are not. You also, during the 1920s, have the development of Catholic organizations, the Guadalupe Mission on the west side, the arrival of Las Madres, a group of nuns uh, who come in November of 1927 and who stay for about 12 years and do an enormous amount of work in the community. And really, the, the, the key person, the most important person, is uh, or was Father James E. Collins. Uh, just an absolutely wonderful story of an individual uh, who was Irish-American, came from, uh, from upstate New York, but yet dedicated the last 27 years of his life to serving uh, the Mexicano community in Salt Lake City. Uh, relations. What, was, what were the relations like between the Mexicanos who were LDS and the Mexicanos who were not LDS? Well, I, I don't think I'll surprise any of you folks when I tell you that it runs the gamut. A lot of the relationships were very, very positive very, very positive. Uh, other times things did not uh, go over very well. I have examples in, he, in my book of people who, uh, individuals who would not let their sons or daughters date individuals that were not members of their, uh, of their church. Uh, so it, it, it really just runs the, runs the gamut. Now, during the Great Depression and the Second World War, uh, if you are familiar with any of the works of uh, Leonard, A Leonard Arrington uh, and some of the economic history of Utah, things were really tough here. Uh, and you have a very dramatic impact upon the lives of the Spanish surname people. The numbers are going to decline from about 
4,000 to around 1,100. Uh, again, there are differences with, with, be, between the experience of the LDS and the Catholic uh, Mexicanos. Um, I, I think really the key thing that I, I want to emphasize about the differences is that the L, the, those individuals that were LDS had an extra layer of assistance that oftentimes was not available to uh, Mexicanos who were not members of the church. Things, however, do turn around quite dramatically during the Second World War. There's increased industrialization. Uh, Utah doesn't import a lot of braceros. If you are familiar with the term braceros, braceros are the, um, the individuals that were brought over beginning in late 1942 uh, from Mexico to primarily to perform agricultural work uh, to fill in spots of people that were working in agriculture previously, but because of the war or because of the, uh, the war economy, these individuals were able to move on to higher paying jobs. And a lot of those folks were brought in as a result of, uh, to, to take over that agricultural work. Uh, Mexican Americans in Salt Lake City benefit very, very much from the war. Uh, they are able to move into occupations that, that previously they had not been able to fill. Uh, there's also, I think, a very dramatic change in uh, the, the, the way that women are perceived. There's the beginning of a change of the way women are perceived. And part of this comes from women doing non-traditional jobs. And again, just very briefly, let me read, read you a quick little passage here. Clotilda Gomez's wartime resume included toiling in, the Salt Lake City, in a Salt Lake City railroad yard. When her husband volunteered for military duty, she was left uh, to support herself and four children. To survive, she first worked as a waitress and clerk, but to her dismay, she was fired from the second job because she was not a U.S. citizen. She eventually procured employment at the railroad yard. And in a 1987 interview, she stated, quote, the men would stand around and watch you work, see how much of it you could take. And she goes on and she details all sorts of sexual harassment. I mean, you can imagine some of the things that went on. Uh, Regardless of the working conditions, she felt, however, proud of her contribution to the war effort. Quote, I think that women changed from that era. They took the change in their lives in order to make decisions and work. And even among Mexican families, there started to be a change with the women because they realized that they were equal to men. So those are some of the uh, things that are happening as far as the women are concerned uh, during this era. All right. And I realize that I'm a little bit behind schedule, so let me just move on as quickly as I can here. Come on. Ah. Ah, there we are. All right. Um, I think really the key thing that we need to get from, especially the World War II era, is that the Mexican Americans who worked in the factories, who worked in the uh, military facilities, and also especially those who went overseas and fought, came back after the war with a totally different perspective. Uh, there's something about getting shot at, I think, and seeing your buddies get killed or injured or you getting injured uh, that makes you rethink the way that you're treated. Um, if, you have, if you're good enough to bleed for your country, am I not then good enough to uh, live wherever I want to live? I think that's a very valid question. And, and I mean, you really see this a lot in Texas uh, and in California. These Mexicanos who are coming back from the war are not going to put up with maltreatment uh, much anymore. And let me just, again, give you a, a, a wonderful story here of, of, a, uh, of a returning war veteran, Epifanio Gonzalez, uh, who uh, won the Silver Star, but yet was denied the opportunity to buy a house in a certain part of Salt Lake City. And he says, quote, how would you feel if you came home decorated? You fought your heart out in the war, and now you say, now I'm an American. I'm just as good as anybody. And then all of a sudden, you're just a second-rate citizen. These individuals were not going to put up with that, so they're going to fight back. Um, another thing that happens during the war is you have a change in the composition of the community. You have the arrival of Puerto Ricans during the Second World War to work in copper mining. You also have a lot of folks from New Mexico and Colorado who come in. But in general, 
the statistics show that there's low educational achievement, there's fairly low economic and educational status for these folks. Uh, during these years, you are going to see the expansion of the Centro Civico Mexicano in Salt Lake City. You're going to see the rise of organizations such as the American GI Forum and the expansion of both the Rama Mexicana and uh, the, uh, the, Guadal the Guadalupe Mission, which eventually becomes a parish. Now, during the years of the 1960s, you are going to have a reduced window to a certain extent due to the economic changes. For example, the economy, the economy of Utah is changing. It is not as heavily dependent on manufacturing as it was before. And part of what happens is you have Mexicanos who are, or Mexican Americans who are applying for jobs that, as maybe clerks or that level of position, and basically the response that they're always getting is, well, you're not qualified. Uh, a lot of different corporations, a lot of different entities in the state uh, have what folks would consider to be unrealistic expectations. Uh, do you really need a college degree to do this particular job? Uh, just because someone does not have a high school education, are they not capable of doing another job? And those are some of the barriers that these folks are, are running up against. Now, uh, the Chicano movement in some places takes a much more militant turn. But here in Utah, it's, I, I'm not saying that, that these folks were not willing to fight for their rights, but the rhetoric that they use is nowhere near as militant as it is in other places. Uh, you have the creation of Socio in uh, late 1967, led by uh, uh, Father Gerald Merrill and led by Dr. Orlando Rivera, who at that time was, uh, I believe he was at, uh, at Lucero at, at, at that time. So you have individuals from the two main religious organizations coming together to form this, this particular group. Uh, don't really have too much time to talk about the economic or education statistics, but just to give you a sense of the activities. Uh, Socio creates uh, an organization called the Institute for Human Resource Development, which is now called uh, Centro de la Familia, unless the name has changed uh, uh, in, in, the, in the last six or seven years. Uh, the idea is we're going to set up programs to train people. We're going to set up individual. We're going to set up programs to give people the skills necessary to survive in a changing economy. We are going to set up programs designed to provide individuals with the skills to survive in society. For example, individuals that maybe have run into trouble with the law and are coming out of prison, we're going to give them skills in, with which to survive. Um, you also have a very significant role by the University of Utah. Uh, they, through a Ford Foundation grant and other grants, they, be, they make a very concerted effort to bring Spanish-speaking people to the campus and to attract kids from the west side. Um, now, why does social decline? Well, uh, there are a lot of reasons that I could go over, but I think I will give you uh, a quote from uh, Dr. Rivera, uh, who views the demise of Socio in many ways as a result of the success of Socio. So let me just read this very, very, very briefly to you. Uh, quote, a lot of our people are moving into better socioeconomic positions because Socio opened up a lot of doors. A lot of these folks are now taking advantage of it. They're assimilating into the culture and they're moving into the professions. And probably 80, 85% of them are enjoying a good life. There are other reasons, but part of what helps to bring down socio is that a lot of folks make it and you just simply do not have the zeal for economic and social change as much as you did when you were not, when you were on the outside looking in. Finally, uh, what were conditions like during the 1980s and into the 1990s? Conditions continue, I think, to improve, I would argue. A lot, the, the, if you look at the uh, education statistics, those are improving. There is a growing number of Spanish-speaking people that, are, that have college degrees, that have high school educations. You also have continued political, social, and religious diversity. The church is very, very active in, in uh, recruiting people uh, all over Latin America, and a lot of those folks are winding up in Salt Lake City. 
and you what you have are at least when I was here you had uh, a circulo argentino you had a club of uh, peruano you even had a Cuban uh, a Utah Cuban American Association so I mean there there are a lot of individuals that are coming from different parts of the United States and different parts of Latin America and moving into Utah uh, you also have growing uh, uh, political diversity and, and you see that very very clearly and, and I need to mention this because uh, this gentleman was a professor of mine at the University of Utah and we never saw eye to eye we were totally different politically but uh, I just want to note his passing uh, Jeff Garzalaza who was a professor of history at the University of Utah for for a few years while I was there um, died, in, died from injuries from an automobile accident that he suffered he, he, he was a uh, basically it uh, been a coma uh, for for several years um, but his story I think is a perfect example Dr. Garzalazo was very very uh, much a man of the left and uh, one of the things that was happening at the University of Utah in the early to mid 1990s was he headed a group called Mecha uh, which is a, a fairly progressive shall we say organization and uh, what he ran into was the fact that the University of Utah, we now had a lot more kids from Argentina and from Latin America. And these individuals were saying, hey, you know what? This stuff about La Raza and this stuff about Chicanismo and this stuff about, this stuff makes no sense to us. So we don't want to be associated with you guys. So we would appreciate, the second group tells Mecha, that you guys not use the term Latino in your... Uh, publications and in your flyers and things like that and, and I mean that led to a just a real uh, uh, nasty debate so I mean that I think is just a perfect example of, of some of the political divisions that you have uh, you also have during these years a very dramatic development of uh, growth of uh, Hispanics as a viable consumer base uh, here in the state of Utah in other words you don't have to go to Talamahu anymore to get Latino products in Salt Lake City right uh, so, I mean, you, you now have stores, you have, uh, uh, you know, large uh, corporations like Sears and Nordstrom's that are advertising in uh, Spanish language newspapers because they recognize that there is a growing and developing uh, economic power base there. Uh, you also have the expansion of the, uh, of the LDS church. Uh, and the arrival of new Spanish speakers. So the community is even is getting even more, becoming even more diverse. It's not, you can't really just say that it's a Mexicano or a Mexican American community, although obviously that partic those particular groups predominate. But I mean, I met Peruvians, Argentines, Bolivians, Cubans, Puerto Ricans. I met all sorts of people from all over the Spanish speaking world in Salt Lake City and and believe me if you would have told me in 1992 when I got to Salt Lake City that I would witness something like the 1996 Hispanic uh, American Festival uh, I, I would have thought that you'd be out of your mind because there's simply it, see, it simply did not occur to me that there could be that many people from that many different places in Latin America that many Spanish speaking folks in Utah but yet we're here and we are becoming a much more important part of the state of Utah and in conclusion, the story of the Spanish-speaking people in the state of Utah, I think, fits in very perfectly with some of the themes that are being developed uh, in other places. Uh, you have the occupational and educational issues that we've described. There's, there are differences, you know, to be honest with you. Uh, if I were a Mexicano, uh, in 1957, for example, I'd much rather, I think I would have much rather have gone to uh, West High in Salt Lake City uh, than in some of the schools in, uh, in South Texas where Mexicano, Mexicano students were basically treated like garbage in a lot of places. They were beaten for using the Spanish language. They were continuously put down. So, I mean, there are differences, but you still do have race issues, you have educational issues, you have occupational issues. Some of the differences, it's the Chicano era is much less strident during those years. Uh, and you also, f from the very, very beginning, you have socio because it, it manages to bring in individuals that have connections to the LDS church, to the Catholic church, and also individuals that have connections to the government. 
they are recognized, and the, and the state government actually here, I would argue, is very, very cooperative uh, with Socio from the very beginning. They don't meet the very, very harsh resistance that these types of groups have met in other places. In sum, um, the figures that I had in my book was that there were about 117, 118,000 Hispanics in the state of Utah uh, in the mid-1990s. The latest figures I've seen, and, I, and I'm sure that someone here will be happy to correct me, uh, the latest figures that I had seen was that they were over now over 200,000, if not pushing a quarter million. 290,000, thank you. It's good, it's good to have an informed audience. I really appreciate that. Uh, so we've got almost 300,000 people, and, and the, the population is what, 2.5, 2.7 million, somewhere around there? So we're becoming a growing voice in the state of Utah. And I think this conference shows that there are people of goodwill in the state of Utah that are looking forward to that increased diversity and, the, and are looking forward to a day when um, we will be an even more active part of the history of the state of Utah. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jorge. We have a, uh, a time for a few questions. I, I just wanted to say that maybe my slip up on the title of his book is Prophetic Mormons in the Hispanic Zion might be Could the be. future of Utah. Who knows? <laughs> um, anyway, questions? Yes. You see the growth in Utah and the Hispanic community vis-a-vis uh, -vis the general population to uh, growing faster uh, than other communities, other states, um, and if so, or if not, why or why not? Would well, I, I, think, I think to a certain extent that that's changing. Um, certainly during the time that I was here doing my research at, at the U, uh, there were a lot of Latinos, a lot of Hispanics, a lot of Mexi Mexicanos and Mexican Americans coming here because the economy was so good in comparison to what was happening, say, in California. Uh, I think that that's part, that, that, that the, the economy, maybe things are not as good as they were in the mid-1990s, but I think the economy remains fairly strong. And in the book, I talk about not just people coming in and working in, and, and living in the Salt Lake area or in, or in the Provo area, but we're now beginning to move out. For example, I've done an article on Mexican uh, casino workers over in Wendover. Uh, there are people working in some of the meat processing plants in Moroni and Hiram and in places like that. So, I mean, I, th I think what's happening is, and I mean, to me, this, this is very, it, it, I, I'm doing some work with a student uh, back at Texas Tech who is, uh, we have an excellent collection on uh, Vietnam and on Vietnamese, Vietnam, Vietnamese Americans in Texas, and he's doing his dissertation on Vietnamese Americans in Texas. And whether, it's, whether you're Cuban, whether you're Vietnamese, whether you're whatever, you come to a place where there is opportunity, if maybe not directly for you, but certainly something for your kids. And I think that that's part of what has attracted Latinos and, and Mexican and Mexican Americans to Utah. It's a good place to live. Uh, you know, there's a lot of folks here, I think, now that are saying, this is not a bad place to raise my kids. And there are certain opportunities. And through that, eth those ethnic networks, they are developing those ties and going out to more and more places. Yes, sir. Two-part question. Yes. In your study, did you find that any Mexican-Americans... Please take the microphone. Thank you. A two-part question. In your uh, studies, did you find any ties between the Mexican population, the immigrant population, to the colonies in Mexico? And were any of them involved directly or indirectly in, the, in La Tercera Convención? Okay. The answer to your first question is no. And the answer to your second question is I don't know. Do, uh, Ignacio, would you help me out here? One of the three um, major individuals, more individuals from the Latino, was one of the leaders okay. of the third third convention, so okay. uh, there is a tie from what happens here to what happens in Mexico, especially in dealing with issue, issues of leadership uh, and philosophy. So yes, would be. 
I, if, there's, if there's one thing that I always appreciate is that it, it, Ignacio always comes to my presentations and he's always very willing to help me out when I don't know the answer. Thank you, Ignacio. Yes, sir. Yes, I've uh, heard about you. I wanted to meet you for many years, but you always escape me. I know, uh, I know who you are. I've seen you. What's, what is your name, sir? That's what I mean. William uh, Professor I'm, William Gonzalez. Ah, I know it. I knew it. Thank you. I'm, and, glad, I'm uh, glad you finally got a... Got I'm uh, from southern Utah. Yes, sir. And when people ask me, where are you from, with that face and that, and I said, well, I'm from occupied Mexico. I'm occupied Mexico, yes. Well, when did your folks get here? I said, well your ancestors get here. So, well, some were already here, and the other half arrived 500 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Which ship did the Mormon Church bring your yep. grandparents in? Yes. That's my other uh, comment. Well, it's been very interesting the way you were talking about uh, the different aspects of the Mexican, the Hispanic, the Chicano, if we say, in Utah. And uh, it's very romantic. Very I, romantic because... I think I think it's a I think it's a wonderful story, and I mean I'm not saying it because I wrote the book on it. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it because w one of the things that I always tell my kids in 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 all of my classes is that history is going on all around you, and the most humble, meek, common person is part of history and is mm -hmm. making history, and here is a perfect example of individuals who most folks had never heard of before, making a very positive contribution and doing exactly what I was just saying a few minutes ago, working diligently at their jobs, sending their kids to school, doing the best that they can to make things better for, them, for themselves and for their kids. And I mean, again, the ties, part of what drew me to do this type of history is the fact that I'm an immigrant myself and I know what it's like to come to a place where you you know, you, you have to start over and your parents have to sacrifice to send you to school and, you know, so I, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I understand that story, I think, very, very much. And I, I hope, I really hope and pray that I have done justice. Well, we're, we haven't folks. even started yet. Well, we've got plenty to go. Yeah, <clears throat> I know. Now, when we, uh, to have this type of co uh, conferences and that, it's kind of embarrassing here because if you sit down and you realize or you analyze the contribution of the Hispanic through this state, it's embarrassing. You know, if it hadn't been for the, when they started in southern Utah, the Mormons went down there, they went down there, they didn't have the slightest idea of what a cowboy, a cow was. They had no idea what sheep were. They didn't have any idea whatsoever what dry, uh, dry land farming was. Yes, sir. And uh, they came down to Monticello in those areas, and they didn't, they were going to starve to death. Yes, sir. But uh, they happened to discover the sheep. They brought the sheep up, and that's it. that is a beautiful little story in Bluff. They brought the sheep up because, hey, there's a lot of open land here where these sheep will do well. Mm -hmm. So they went and bought some sheep over in Colorado. They brought them to Bluff, and they said, who's going to take care of them? I said, oh, the boys will. And so they, they put the young kids out to take care of the sheep. And como dicen los mexicanos, no sabía nada. De las borregas, eh? Exactly. And they turned the sheep out, and for a while there they had the fattest coyotes in that part of the county, huh? Yes, sir. They had nothing. And then after that, it began to develop, and uh, you have some of the biggest sheep ranches in the nation in that area, they are directed and cared for by New Mexicans. Yes, Another thing that came up is uh, the cowboys, the whole cowboy culture. And John Wayne and uh, all of those great American cowboys probably turning in their grave when I say this. Well, you, you know well, what? Wait a minute, I've got something. This is a good one. <laughs> you know. I got a good one too. That's what <laughs> So anyway, and, when, we have, and we have 30 seconds. Okay. okay. <laughs> and when we uh, uh, discuss, uh, when I say this about the cowboys, I'll bet you John Wayne, all the great American cowboys turn in their graves because they got famous dressed up as Mexicans. Can, can you imagine, they were Mexicans. Can you imagine the reaction that I get when I say that in Texas? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you very much.